Good evening. I want to thank J Street for bringing us our guest tonight. And on behalf of the leadership and members of Beth Israel, I want to welcome all of you. I'd like to begin, and I appreciate given, being given a few moments here, with something that I heard on the APAC rabbinic mission to Israel this summer that I was, I was on during the war in Gaza. We were meeting with Rabbi Daniel Hartman, one of Judaism's great contemporary thinkers, and he said that he could summarize the entire Torah in about two sentences. God spoke to the children of Israel and said unto them, You shall do X, Y, and Z. And the children of Israel answered and said unto God, No. <laughs> the point of this summary is the possibility that God chose the Jewish people because God loves a good argument. And for 2,000 years, we've given him just that. We are an argumentative people. And that is one of the reasons that we have done what no other people on earth have ever done. We survived 2,000 years of exile. To some, it may seem that the Jewish community is dysfunctional, especially in the way that we argue over Israel. They may be right, but we've been that way for a long time, and ultimately it has served us well. A core value of all this argumentation is that we do not believe that any of us are the sole possessors of truth. There are nuances, subtleties, shades of gray in this world. We Jews do really like a good argument, and we're pretty sure that pleases God. We argue with one another, but we do not demonize one another. The reason the Talmud is so darn long is that all the arguments mustered by both sides are recorded. Jews have always understood that to criticize another is an act of love. That is why, in a single chapter in Leviticus, we are commanded both to reprove our fellow and love our neighbor. Love and criticism in Judaism go together. As a matter of fact, our rabbis teach us that we are not only supposed to respect and tolerate those Jews with whom we disagree, we are to love them. Or at least we're not allowed to hate another Jew. The rabbis were serious about that. As they looked at Jerusalem smoldering in the ashes of the Roman fires, they concluded that an important reason for the destruction was that Jews hated each other. Don't dismiss that as I used to was rabbinic hyperbole. The rabbis were aware of how we Jews can be, as you all know, our own worst enemies. The rabbis during the destruction of the temple knew that too many Jews questioned the motives of other Jews, delegitimized them, demonized them, and that weakened the Jewish community and made it more susceptible to destruction. Those who believe that certain views ought not be articulated in certain places, like a synagogue, or that certain voices ought not be heard, really misunderstand what a synagogue is. Take this one. It's called Beth Israel, the House of Israel. Those who named this congregation, the first one in San Diego, did not call it the House of God, but the House of Israel, belonging to the entire Jewish community and welcoming everyone to it. They imagined this House of Israel as being a big tent that invited the airing of views and opinions to help us all grow and learn. Now, Rabbi Eric Yaffe, an ardent Zionist and former leader of the Reform Movement, somewhat of an expert on both Israel and North American synagogue life, said this about conversations about Israel in America. When congregations are at their best, members hold respectful debates, truly listen to each other, and speak personal truths without reprimanding those with whom they disagree. Those who argue that diaspora Jews should not publicly criticize Israel Israel's government, particularly on policies pertaining to peace and security, fundamentally misunderstand the nature of Zionism, the national liberation movement of the Jewish people. Zionism brought Israel into existence and bestowed upon Jews everywhere a role in determining the character of the Jewish state, while final authority rests with Israel's citizens, whether Jewish or not. Israel invites Jews of every country in the diaspora not only to visit frequently, contribute financially, and generate support for its policies, but also to engage in its affairs, participate in its debates, and offer criticism of its actions. 
Expressing criticism, even harsh criticism, requires no special permission from Israeli or diaspora leaders. The right to do so is inherent in the Zionist mission. In short, Rabbi Yaffe concludes, our role in upholding the Zionist vision is to offer Israel unconditional support, but that is not the same as uncritical support. Now, some of you may be dismissive of Rabbi Yaffe because of his liberal American politics. I assure you he is solidly middle of the road when it comes to Israel. But still, allow me to share for a few comments from a right-wing Israeli politician, one who has mostly been against the two-state solution, but is now a little ambiguous about his thinking, a Likud leader, who's speaking about the atmosphere of hostility between those who are for and against the peace process, declared, we are not prepared to triumph in the war of terror, only to fail in the struggle over for our character. We are in the midst of an ongoing war against external enemies, but we must cease to regard each other as enemies from within. And reflecting on the civil discourse that sometimes happens here in America, this right-wing politician said, we are all Zionists, but we think differently about what is best for Israel. The differences in opinion among American Zionists sometimes put Zionism into collision course. But nonetheless, anyone who thinks differently from me is still as much a Zionist as I am. These words were said by the right-wing president of the State of Israel, Reuven Rivlin. And inspired by them, and as the senior rabbi as this of this House of Israel, I proclaim the two, the following two rules for tonight in our sanctuary. There will be no demonizing or delegitimizing of those with whom you disagree, and there will be no impugning of the Zionism or the love of Israel of those with whom you disagree. Good evening. I'm Jonathan Litt. My wife is Rhonda Amber, and we are proud to be founding members of J Street San Diego. We have been a Temple Emmanuel family for over 30 years and are delighted to have our rabbis, Marty Lawson and Devorah Marcus, with us tonight. And all of us from J Street thank Jason Berkowitz, representing Congressman Scott Peters, Daniel Hazard, representing Congresswoman Susan Davis, and everyone in the audience for taking their time to come this evening. I was privileged to spend part of my childhood in Israel when my father installed the first computer for the IDF in 1960. Yitzhak Rabin wrote a personal letter to him thanking him for his service to Israel. But as a seven-year-old, I was more impressed with the wonderful smells and sights of my new Middle Eastern neighborhood. I became imprinted with them, and once imprinted, you don't forget. So each time I go back there as an adult to visit, I am suffused with memories and filled with pride and joy in being part and witness to one of the great miracles in our people's history that began in the 19th century and continues on in the 21st. But along with the growing accomplishments, I realize there are still serious problems confronting our Jewish homeland, some long-standing and some new, but chief among them has been the failure to achieve a political agreement in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. The ongoing violence in Jerusalem and this summer's tragic war in the Gaza Strip reminds us that Israel and its Palestinian neighbors are trapped in a cycle of destruction. Israel's control of the Palestinian people in the West Bank is growing more untenable, and after every hate crime, terrorist attack, or act of incitement, the forces of extremism grow stronger. In the past, when there have been moments of peril for Israel, our parents and grandparents rose to the occasion to secure it, doubling their investment by giving money 
building institutions and visiting. It is now up to us to recommit and build on the foundation of our parents. J Street was founded six years ago to represent the voice of American Jews like myself who believe that Israel's long-term security, democracy, and Jewish character depend on the two-state existence with the Palestinians. After only six years, J Street has 180,000 supporters nationwide in 50 local chapters, including 7,500 students on 60 college campuses. We've become an important voice in synagogue and temple congregations with over 800 rabbis on our rabbinic cabinet. Here in San Diego alone, we have nearly 2,000 members. We are overwhelmingly a volunteer organization that uses its own time and money. We are comprised of students, people in the middle of their careers, and retirees, and we are here tonight. We organize the Jewish community to advocate the pro-Israel voice that is being heard in Washington accurately reflects the values and views of the majority of American Jews. Unfortunately, that wasn't always the case. For a long time, we were told that there was only one way to be pro-Israel, and that was by endorsing every policy and position of the current Israeli government. Of course, this kind of thinking doesn't really benefit anyone. It doesn't help Israel overcome the serious and complex challenges that it is facing, and it essentially tells thousands of American Jews, particularly young Jews, who are looking for a way to connect with Israel and the Jewish community, that their views are wrong or dangerous. But that concept of universal agreement doesn't really exist anywhere especially not in Israel, where there is vibrant debate and disagreement on every issue you can think of. Openness has sustained us for thousands of years, even in the darkest time. It's how we come up with our best ideas and weed out the weaker ones. Shutting down that debate in the name of unity will ultimately shut down everything that makes us a community, and particularly an issue as critical to our community's identity as Israel deserves a vigorous, inclusive, far-reaching, and civil discussion. Many of us have our personal dreams for Israel. I know I do. Twelve years ago, Rhonda and I built a house in Zichron Yaakov in the hope that we could one day retire there and have our children and grandchildren visit us. But fulfilling personal dreams is not enough. We also have a responsibility to strengthen Israel's borders and the Jewish and democratic principles that are the core of its existence. And Rhonda and I have a duty to ensure that our children are proud of what we have built and will continue where we have left off. Perhaps no one understands this better than Peter Beiner. Tonight's event is a terrific opportunity to delve into the most important issues facing our community. And I'm very pleased to turn things over to Sandra Silverstein to introduce him.
After Mr. Beinart's presentation, this distinguished panel of San Diego rabbis will engage in a dialogue with him. Following the dialogue, our rabbis and our speaker will answer your written questions. If you have not received an index card, there will be volunteers in the aisles who will provide you with one. Okay? That, and now I have the pleasure of introducing tonight's speaker, Peter Bynum. He is an associate professor of journalism and political science at the City University of New York. He is also a contributor to The Atlantic, The National Journal, a senior columnist at Haaretz, a CNN political commentator, and a senior fellow at the New America Foundation. Mr. Beinart has served both as the managing editor and the editor of the New Republic. He has written for many leading publications, such as the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Financial Times, and the Boston Globe. His widely discussed book, The Crisis of Zionism, which was published in 2012, was described by President Clinton as a deeply important book for anyone who cares about Israel. I would also like to welcome our panel of rabbis. Rabbi Philip Graubart is senior rabbi at Congregation Bethel. Rabbi Graubart was ordained at Jewish Theological Seminary, has a master's degree in Hebrew from Hebrew University, and is a prolific author in his own right, and I cannot resist, but he writes some really great mysteries. <laughs> Books are for sale in the outer <laughs> Oops, this is another book there. Okay, Rabbi. <laughs> Rabbi Devorah Marcus serves Temple Emmanuel. She has a degree in speech communication with an emphasis in music and religious studies. She was ordained at Hebrew Union College. And Rabbi Gerson is assistant rabbi at my congregation, Beth Israel. She earned an MA from Harvard Divinity School was ordained at Hebrew Union College, and she has written for My Jewish Learning and the Huffington Post. So welcome our panel and our speakers. Thank you. Um, uh, it's really a pleasure and privilege to be here. Um, I want to start by saying something to the people who came uh, who disagree with me. Um, if you are the person who, in the audience who thinks you most de passionately disagree with my point of view, you're the person I want to thank the most. Because in the Jewish community, we have a tendency to only go and hear the people we agree with. That is as true on the Jewish left as it is true on the Jewish right. So by coming to hear someone who you disagree with, or you think you disagree with, you are setting an example for us all. Yasher Koach, I appreciate it. I know this is a controversial subject, the relationship between American Jews and Israel. After my book came out, a friend asked me, have there been any angry words? <laughs> Personal denunciations? Ad hominem attacks? And I said, you mean outside of my own family? <laughs> yeah, there have been a few. My wife sent out an email, the, count, the, the kind that spouses sometimes do. She said, you can agree or disagree with Peter's argument, but we're very proud that he wrote a book. <laughs> so she got an email back the next day. The person said, I would never buy that book. I think Peter's a threat to the Jewish people. I wouldn't give him a dime. So my wife wrote it on the email, and she said, uh, who was that? He seemed so angry. And I said, don't you remember? That's my cousin David. I haven't heard from him in years. <laughs> My mother said it was a good thing that my grandmother didn't know how to blog. <laughs> Let me start by explaining why I believe that Israel's creation has been such a blessing for the Jewish people. First, it's been a blessing because we now have what we did not have in the 1940s, when our people were being led to the slaughter, a country whose mission statement is the protection of Jewish life. 
Some younger American Jews may take that for granted. I don't. I still remember watching, when I was in high school, a Jewish state send airplanes to pick up the Jews of Ethiopia, one of the poorest and most reviled communities on earth, and return them to be with the people from whom they had been estranged since the days when the temple stood. Second, Israel has been a blessing because thanks to the Zionist movement, we have a Jewish state as a cultural center for Jews around the world, based upon the revival of Hebrew as a living language, and with all the problems that we have maintaining diaspora Jewish life, one can only imagine how much harder they would be if we did not have Israel and modern Hebrew to anchor us. But these inspiring accomplishments, I believe, are being put at risk by Israeli settlement of the West Bank and the resulting threat to Israel's character as a democratic Jewish state. Democracy is not the whole of the Zionist dream. Israel is not, in my opinion, should not be a secular democracy just like the United States. It should have, as I argue in my book, a special obligation to the Jewish people. But if democracy is not the entirety of the Zionist dream, it is necessary to the Zionist dream. Theodore Herzl understood this. His 1902 novel, Anthmalant, is largely about an election in an imagined Jewish state between one candidate whose party includes Arabs and supports the right of Arabs to vote, and another party that wants to restrict the vote to Jews alone. And in his novel, Herzl has one of the candidates who believes in democracy tell the people of this imagined Jewish state, quote, you must hold fast to liberality, tolerance, and love of mankind. Only then is Zion truly Zion." Unquote. Israel's founders understood this. In 1948, three years after the Holocaust, with the stench of Jewish death still hanging over Europe, and Israel in a war for its very survival against its Arab neighbors, Israel's founders wrote a declaration of independence that promised, quote, complete equality of social and political rights, irrespective of race, religion, or sex, unquote. For me, that democratic vision is crucial to the miracle that is the Jewish return to sovereignty in the land of Israel, and it's a big part of the reason an Israeli flag hangs in my two young children's room. But that miracle is today imperiled by Israel's control of the West Bank, where, in flagrant violation of the principles of Israel's Declaration of Independence, Jews carry identity cards with blue covers that give them citizenship, the right to vote, the right to due process, and the right to be waived through checkpoints. West Bank Palestinians, by contrast, carry identity cards with green or orange covers that deny them citizenship in any state, deny them the right to vote for the government of any state, and severely restrict their travel. Those cards place them under the jurisdiction of military courts, where evidence is largely secret, where people are often held for months or even years without trial, and where, according to an investigation by the Israeli newspaper Haaretz, more than 99% of those tried in 2010 were convicted. Between 2005 and 2010, according to the Israeli human rights group B'Tselem, 835 Palestinian minors, teenagers basically, were brought before military courts in the West Bank on charge of a stone throwing. One was found innocent. This is not to say that Jews who live in the West Bank are bad people. They're not bad people. They're mostly people who moved to the West Bank because the Israeli government made it cheaper for them to live there. And it's not to say that Jews should not be able to live in the West Bank, the place where, according to Jewish tradition, all our matriarchs and patriarchs are laid to rest. I believe Jews should be able to live in the West Bank, either as equal citizens in land next to Israel in a peace agreement, or as equal citizens in a Palestinian state. The problem is not that Jews live in the West Bank is that today the West Bank is a place where, contrary to the majestic vision of Israel's founders, citizenship is ethnically based, where Jews and Palestinians live under a different law. <clears throat> and as Israel's first Prime Minister, David Ben-Gurion, warned, if Israel makes permanent its occupation of the West Bank, it will be forced to choose between its Jewish and democratic characters. 
It will invite Palestinians into a one-state struggle that Israel cannot win because its efforts to maintain itself as a non-democratic Jewish state will make it a pariah in the world. This is what former Israeli Prime Minister Ehud Barak and Ehud Olmert meant when they both warned in recent years <coughs> of a potential apartheid future and a South Africa-style struggle for the character of the one state between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean Sea. It's what former Israeli Justice Minister Tzipi Livni meant when she warned recently that, quote, the existence of Israel as a democratic Jewish state is in mortal danger, unquote. I want to be very clear. I believe the Palestinians do bear some of the blame for the failure to achieve the two-state solution that would allow Israel to remain a democratic Jewish state. The Palestinians have badly undermined their cause through the terrorism that I call in my book grotesque. There is a troubling Palestinian tendency to deny the historic connection between the Jewish people and the land of Israel. And as I say in my book, there are real questions about whether Palestinian leaders will make the compromises especially on refugee return, necessary for a two-state solution to come to pass. But even if I conceded every nasty thing that anyone could possibly say about the Palestinians, it is not the Palestinians who are essentially paying Israelis to move into the West Bank. In 2012, a report in the Israeli newspaper Yedir Akhronot noted that the settlements received 70% more money per person than do cities and towns inside Israel proper. In 2012, Israel's then finance minister boasted that during Benjamin Netanyahu's time as prime minister, the portion of Israel's budget going to the settlements has doubled, which helps explain why in 2013, housing growth in increased 5% in Israel proper and 130% in settlements in the West Bank. So it's not enough to say that Israel will get a handle on settlement growth when the Palestinians finally decide to live in peace in a two-state solution. Because by supporting settlement growth, you're pushing Palestinians in exactly the direction we don't want them to go. Every time Israel subsidizes more Israelis to move to the West Bank, we make those Palestinian leaders who will reluctantly, I underscore reluctantly, accept Israel's right to exist and who are today cooperating against terrorism. As Israel's own defense officials say Mahmoud Abbas is doing, we make them look like fools. And every time Israel makes it harder to build a viable Palestinian state, we make Hezbollah and Hamas stronger. We don't know if the Palestinians will ultimately make the concessions, especially on refugee return, necessary for a two-state solution to come to pass. But we can be darn sure they won't make those concessions if they won't even get a viable Palestinian state in return. So even if you don't believe that a Palestinian state is possible tomorrow, you have, in my opinion, an obligation to try to stop the settlement growth that will soon foreclose the possibility of a Palestinian state ever. Because when you destroy the two-state solution, you give Israel's enemies the capacity to do politically what they have been unable to do, thank God, militarily, destroy Israel as a Jewish state. Zionism, at its core, is about giving Jews control over our own destiny. Settlement growth threatens the core of the Zionist dream because it takes that destiny out of Jewish hands. All of which, I think, raises a question for those of us here in the United States. In the face of this crisis of Israeli democracy, this crisis of Zionism, why are American Jewish leaders so silent? I'll give you the answer that American Jewish leaders offer themselves, and then I'll suggest an answer of my own. The first answer that American Jewish leaders give is that it is not their place to criticize Israeli policy, since American Jews don't live in Israel, and thus don't bear the consequences of the policies we propose. Yet those same American Jewish leaders don't live among the Palestinians either, and yet they criticize Palestinian actions all the time. Nor do American Jewish leaders live in Europe, and yet they constantly criticize European governments, usually for their policies towards Israel. And American Jewish leaders didn't live in the former Soviet Union, yet they moved heaven and earth when the Soviets were oppressing their Jewish population. And American Jewish leaders don't live in Syria or Iran, yet they speak out passionately about the crimes occurring there. In truth, I think, American Jews have a very proud history of speaking out about things that happen in countries in which we do not live. So why exclude the foreign country Israel about which we care the most? 
Secondly, American Jewish leaders sometimes claim that they can't criticize Israeli settlement policy because a Palestinian state might imperil Israeli security. As it happens, that position puts them at odds with the vast majority of Israel's former top security officials, since every former head of the Mossad and Shin Bet, Israel's external and internal security services, who have publicly spoken in recent years, and every former head of the Israeli Defense Forces except one, publicly favors a Palestinian state near the 1967 line. But even if you think those security officials are wrong, and that Israel needs to maintain military control of the West Bank for security reasons, that still doesn't justify paying Israeli civilians to move into the West Bank. After all, if the Arab countries were to invade Israel again, having remote civilian settlements scattered throughout the West Bank would be a security nightmare for the Israel Defense Forces. So even on their own terms, I think, the argument that American Jewish organizations offer for their silence don't make much sense. The real reason for this silence, I believe, goes deeper. It has to do with the way that American Jewish leaders describe the Jewish condition. The only kind of threat to Israel that American Jewish leaders generally feel comfortable publicly discussing are threats from outside. For instance, the threat from global anti-Semitism or the threat from Iran. There are such threats. They need to be combated and discussed. But I think the reason that American Jewish leaders feel comfortable publicly discussing only these external threats, is because doing so fits into the familiar narrative of Jews as a weak, menaced, and reviled people. At the core of the American Jewish community's unwillingness to confront the internal threats to Israel's democratic character lies the American Jewish community's unwillingness to accept that although we still face threats from without, that in fundamental ways the Jewish condition has changed. That today, some of our deepest challenges stem not from our weakness, but from our power. Consider the way that we discuss our holidays. You know there's a joke that every Jewish holiday has the same plot. They tried to kill us, we survived, let's eat. <laughs> and I think there's a reason that American Jews laugh at that joke, is because so often that's the way we retell the story of our holidays. So you ask many American Jews about the holiday of Purim, which is my daughter's favorite holiday because it brings together two of the things that she loves most in the world, pastries and dress-up. <laughs> and they'll say, sure, oh, I know the story of Purim, sure. Haman tried to kill the Jews of Persia, but Esther and Mordecai, they rose up and they saved the Jews and well, then the story's over and we eat our hamantashen, which are really delicious. But that's not the way the book of Esther ends. It doesn't end with Jewish survival. It ends with the Persian king Ahasuerus giving Mordecai the right to take revenge upon Haman's people, and the Jews killing 75,000 souls. It ends, in other words, not with survival, but with power, with a troubling act of Jewish power about which our tradition has much to say, and yet usually we don't talk about that. Or consider the way that American Jews discuss, discuss Hanukkah, which starts tomorrow night, which is my eight-year-old son's favorite holiday, because it brings together two of the things that he loves most in the world, Warfare and presence. <laughs> we reached, a couple years ago we had a problem because a rabbi at my son's Jewish day school told him that when Mashiach comes, when the Messiah comes, there'll be no more war. He was devastated. <laughs> we, we tried to convince him that this was not imminent, as far as we knew. <laughs> About Hanukkah we say the Syrian Greeks wouldn't let us practice Judaism, but the Maccabee family rose up and they restored Jewish sovereignty, and they rededicated the temple, and the oil lasted for eight days, which was a miracle, and then, well, the story's over, and we eat our latkes, which are really delicious. <laughs> but why do we stop the story there? The Maccabees became the Husbandian dynasty, the last experiment in Jewish sovereignty before our own time. It was a very troubled experience. It's one of the reasons the rabbis of the Talmud didn't like Hanukkah very much, because they knew what the, Husbandi, what the Maccabees had become once they took power. But we don't talk about that, I believe, for the same reason we don't talk about the internal threats to Israel's democratic future. Because we don't talk enough about the ethical responsibilities of Jewish power. And it is this failure to talk about Jewish power, to engage with what our tradition has to say about what comes after victimhood and survival, that helps explain why so many young American Jewish kids feel so alienated from our community's discussion about Israel. It's because those kids, more than their parents and grandparents, are growing up with power and privilege in the United States. 
and they see Israel as a regional superpower. And so it is precisely what our tradition has to say about Jewish power that could be most relevant to them if we ever talked about it. I think we need to tell young American Jews that as the generation growing up in an age of unprecedented Jewish power, they have been tasked by Jewish history with a very special obligation. During our long night of powerlessness, Jews spun visions of dignity and justice that inspired the world. But only now, in this age, can we learn the true meaning of those ethical visions. Because if the Jewish tradition of justice forged in powerlessness cannot survive the confrontation with Jewish power, if it cannot inform the actions of a Jewish state, then in retrospect, what good was it? We need to tell young American Jews that this Jewish state is their birthright, their patrimony. It was one at a cost in blood and suffering that they can scarcely even imagine. And it was not born to be another Hasmonean dynasty. It was born to live the Enlightenment ideals that Europe had betrayed. We should tell young American Jews that if that kind of democratic Jewish state dies, it will be a stain upon their lives. That Israel's collapse as a democratic project will have as profound an impact on their experience as Jews as Israel's creation has for their parents and grandparents. We should tell them that in the 1960s, the best of their parents' generation could have been found in places like Alabama and Mississippi when American democracy was in its moment of crucible, and that they need to find a way of being involved in the struggle for Israeli democracy, because although Israel may not be their country, the Jewish people are their people, and their fate is thus intertwined with the fate of that small nation half a world away. People sometimes ask me about the conversations I have with folks like my cousin David, who aren't too happy about some of the things that I write about Israel. But in truth, those aren't the conversations I worry about. The conversations I worry about are the conversations I may have one day with my eight-year-old son and my six-year-old daughter if we let the dream of the democratic Jewish state die on our watch. I don't want to have those conversations. I want Ezra and Naomi to one day put up the flag of a democratic Jewish state in their own children's womb. That, in my opinion, is the great Jewish struggle of our time. Thank you. Israeli democracy that come from 
Well, the Palestinian realm, Palestinian rejectionism, it really wasn't that long ago that, that they were offered a full state and they rejected it. And this continued rejectionism is the, really the thing that fuels Israeli extremism. And yeah, that's the first point. Um, the other is that I wonder why, and I wondered since I read your book, why you don't insist on, on a full and sincere engagement with young people, young American Jews, with the Israeli democratic process, the Israeli political system. I mean, that would be an inspiring story to tell. I, 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 let's say, I mean, you and I have the same goals, two states, and a, you know, a fair and equitable division of the territories. Well, well, there's inspiring political parties in Israel that have the same goal. There's NGOs, there's human rights organizations, Jewish human rights organizations. I mean, your approach, it seems to me, is we're American Jews, we should use our political system to kind of get what we want, but I mean, there's an equally interesting and valid and inspiring story in Israel itself of a vital, vibrant political process that are working for those same goals, and, and that might be the way to, to really inspire the next generation of American Jews, but generally what I hear from you is a kind of condescension towards the, Ameri the Israeli political system, let's, let's work around it, let's, let's boycott here, the products they make in the West Bank. I mean, why not take a positive approach and support those elements in Israeli democracy that we agree with, and, and that could fill in the pride for the next generation. I don't know. <laughs> maybe let us all, maybe it would work better if we all... Shared like an initial response, and yeah. then yeah. like in case any of it overlaps. Because we have to give them time to talk. I do have a follow-up question about young American Jews. So your question, Rabbi Bogart, is why why doesn't Peter insist on full engagement of young American Jews with the Israeli political process? And my question actually kind of in some ways um, precedes that question. And my question, having come from the Hillel world and seeing just how disengaged um, both my generation and the generation that is about to follow me um, is, is how how do we re-engage young American Jews? And you wrote about this a little bit, and you, you wrote more about the failure in, in, your, in your article, The Failure of the American Jewish Establishment, the New York Review of Books several years ago, which started this conversation. But So the question that comes out of, of this for me is how do we re-engage young American Jews who feel alienated by the American Jewish conversation about Israel as it stands now, and ashamed of that conversation, um, and or, and, and estranged from it, and, and just and also ashamed of Israelis, po Israeli policies in the settlements, um, and so have just chosen to completely have chosen apathy instead. Um, I think that that question has to kind of come before how do we then engage them? How do we get them engaged to begin with? Um, I think that my challenges when I read. As I've read your articles and and your book, um, to me it felt like a missive of brokenheartedness after having a fantasy of what any country is, and then discovering that the fantasy is not true, and having your heart be broken about that broken dream. And to me, it represents not a failure of democracy and not a crisis of Zionism, but a failure of education within some communities and in some places in America to offer a more nuanced um, and responsible conversation about what it is to be a nation participating in survival in this world. If we were to string together, we could eat, my, my frustration is that I could easily string together a series of narratives and examples similar to the one that you share in your book that underscore for you your perspective on the crisis of Zionism. I could do the same thing here about America and create a picture of an American democracy that is on the verge of implosion and uh, a totalitarianistic dictatorship waiting to, to rise up in the ashes of the dream that was America. Um, there are often in any society, and I think in any healthy society, a variety of expressions some that we resonate with, some that we find repugnant. Um, and in your book, you don't give voice or time to the incredible history and diversity of expression of countering the voice of extremism and fundamentalism within 
within Israeli society. And you do mention it here and there, and you do give you know slight nods and acknowledgments to it. But you know, my experience of Israel is one in which one of my best friends uh, became a religious Zionist and a settler um, in um, in one of in in one of the in Bat Ein, in one of the most extreme uh, settlement communities. And one of my other uh, close, dear friends in Israel is the leader of Israel's housing rights movement um, and one of the chief advocates advocating against the Israeli government for Bedouin housing rights down in the south and challenging the Israeli government daily as her, as her life. Um, and all three of us had lunch together and had a wonderful conversation last time I was in Israel. It was really uh, remarkable. That to me is my experience of Israel, is a, a complicated society that is multi-vocal, multi-faceted, um, and has a vibrancy of, of, of voices. And, and you reference Avi Dor Lieberman a lot, and he is not a voice that many of us, well, I don't want to speak for him actually, so I'll say, not a voice that I resonate with um, in Israel. Um, and there are an increasing number of people who have been drawn towards that extremist voice, but that also comes as a, at the end of a series of frustrated experiences where, you know, after walking away from Gaza, after giving up certain territories, after making certain concessions, many of my colleagues and friends in Israel feel like, and I think understandably so, at what point do we have to completely surrender our right to have safe and secure borders uh, for the other kids to play nice with us. And we're, ta we're talking here, we're not talking about governments that are opposing each other, we're talking about institutions that, that deny Israel's right to exist, as though that was a question on the table. Um, and so we are talking about Israel's potential disruptions at the hand of Hamas. And I don't want to minimize the war this summer because Israel withdrew from Gaza, Egypt closed the Rafah border, Egypt has, has shut down shipments of supplies into, into Gaza, it's not just Israel, and Egypt has done it for the same reason that Israel has done it, and Hamas has used all of its international aid. Instead of building roads and schools and hospitals for its people, it has purchased missiles, which it then launched at an incredible rate into Israel. And just because they were unsuccessful in their military campaign does not mean that we should condescendingly and paternalistically dismiss the intention of destruction behind those acts. So. Uh, uh, well, let me start by saying that you can read every single word I've ever written about Israel. You will not find a, sing a single sentence in which I condescendingly dismissed and uh, the, the importance of Hamas's claim in its charter and repeated claim to destroy Israel. Um, uh, um, let me um, kind of respond to these in turn. Um, on the question of how to fight against Palestinian objections, um, for me, the fight to keep Israel a democracy, the fight to keep alive the possibility of the Palestine, of Palestinian state is the fight against Palestinian rejections, is the fight against Palestinian extremism. Let me explain <coughs> what I mean by this. I know a lot of Palestinians. Palestinians are divided between two perspectives. It's important to understand what these two perspectives are. There are no Palestinians that I have ever met that are happy that Israel was created. Every Palestinian I know thinks that Israel's creation was an historic tragedy for them, and they believe it was racist and colonialist and ethnic cleansing and apartheid in every nasty word you can possibly think of. That's not the debate among Palestinians about whether you like Israel or not. Nobody likes Israel. The debate is different. The debate is between those Palestinians who accept that they have lost, that their his 100 year struggle to prevent a Jewish state, to destroy a Jewish state, has failed. And with every successive conflict, their condition has gotten worse and worse and worse. And so, therefore, they will accept 22% of British mandatory Palestine, which is the West Bank and Gaza, even though they would desperately love to return to their homes in Haifa and Jaffa throughout Israel because they at least then will not have their children living under a foreign army. That's group number one, who on pragmatic grounds, recognizing that they can't reverse history even though they wish they could, will accept Israel's right to exist if they can have a state alongside. I think that view is represented by Salam Fayyad and to some degree by Mahmoud Abbas. 
The second view, which is represented by people in Hamas, is that you should, you should fight forever, no matter how many of their children die and how many of your children die, in order to destroy Israel. It is crucially important that Israel act in a way to strengthen group number one against group number two. And when you make the possibility of a Palestinian state impossible, by building more and more settlements that make the, the contiguity of a Palestinian state impossible for Palestinians to imagine, then you play right into the Palestinian extremists, the Palestinian rejectionists, who say, you know what? They won't even give us 22% of British mandatory Palestine. We have no choice but to struggle forever for all of it. So for me, the, the, the struggle against Palestinian rejectionism is precisely the struggle to strengthen those Palestinians who, for pragmatic reasons, not because they're Zionists, but for pragmatic reasons, will live alongside Israel against those who won't. And Israel has a very important vote. If you look at Palestinian public opinion, for instance, you can see the way it rises and falls in response to Israeli policy. Um, and, and, and so Israel has an important role in that struggle against Palestinian rejections. Um, on the question of um, young American Jews, uh, why shouldn't young American Jews go to Israel and participate in Israeli politics? I would love them to do that. In fact, I think the most important thing that we could do, perhaps as a community, is to start sending our kids to Israel. When I, when I say we send our kids to Israel, I mean we send them to all of Israel. Which is to say, if you want to have a real encounter with Israel, we want our kids to really understand that country. Love it, but really understand it too. We don't only send them to the beach in Tel Aviv, and to hike in the Galil, and to the Kotel. All experiences that I had as a child and was very privileged to. We also send them to have some experience with the millions, of, the 50% of Israeli people who live under Israeli control who are Palestinian. 50% of the people who live under Israeli control are Palestinian, and many of those people lack a passport, they lack the right to vote for the government that controls their lives, and they live under a radically different legal system than their Jewish neighbors. And that going to experience that part of Israel, and it is Israel today, is I think the very beginning of a real engagement and a real love and a real connection and a real struggle with the real Israel. So that's precisely what I want American Jewish kids to do. Um, on the question of um, uh, the idea that Israel, um, uh, that, that what, whatever I said about Israel could also be said about the United States, I actually spend a great deal of my time writing about my deep concern about the state of Israel, American democracy. Um, but Israel has a particular problem that America does not have. And it's a very important problem. We do not have millions of people who have been living in the United States for almost 50 years, who by virtue of their religion and ethnicity cannot become citizens, cannot vote, and who we have established a separate legal system for because of their religion and ethnicity. That is a very profound problem. That problem, you cannot permanently, I believe, control millions of people who lack the basic rights that we take for granted, and yet were Israel to give them those rights within the state of Israel, Israel would lose its Jewish character. So that is a particular problem in Israeli democracy, a very serious problem that I think we have, have, to, we have to address. It doesn't prevent us from talking about the campaign finance system and all kinds of problems in the American political system that drive me crazy every day. Um, I want to say something about Gaza because it's very, very important to this conversation and it comes up again and again. Israel left Gaza uh, and then received rocket fire. Um, I happened to be in Israel with my six-year-old during the first week of the Gaza War. Um, so um, I, I, um, the, the experience, I got some small taste of what it was like to be in Israel during that war, and it was terrifying. Um, but one of the difficult things that we have to accept as a Jewish community in the United States is that Israel remains the occupying power in Gaza. Now that may sound very, very strange, but there is a reason that the United States and the United Nations both consider Gaza to be under Israeli control. The reason is that Israel controls access to Gaza by air, land, and sea, except for the Rafah checkpoint in Egypt. And Israel controls the airspace, and Israel controls the population registry. Which means if you're the child born in Gaza, 
your name is put into an Israeli computer system, and that determines whether you can leave. If the United States controlled access to Canada by air, land, and sea, and if you were born to Canada, you were put into an American uh, computer system which determined whether you could go and leave, we would be occupying Canada. That is not to justify at all the horrific actions of Hamas, both to their own people or to Israel. But it's just to make the important point that Israel did not sign a peace agreement that created a Palestinian state in Gaza. It withdrew its settlers, but it re retained control. Do you know that a third of the Arab of the Arab land inside the Gaza Strip is off limits to the Palestinians who live in Gaza because Israel has a record of security perimeter inside the Gaza Strip from which Palestinians are barred? This is not to justify anything that Hamas does. It's simply to say that when we talk about Israel having left Gaza as if we gave Palestinians complete control, it is virtually impossible to export out of Gaza today into Israel or into the West Bank, which are their traditional markets. Israel has completely shut down exports from Gaza since the disengagement in 2006. The first truckload of cucumbers from Gaza in seven years left this, left just in November. So this is an important context for us to understand this. Um, the last point I want to make um, is about young American Jews. How to re-engage. I believe that the beginning of re-engaging young American Jews with Israel starts with re-engaging young American Jews with Judaism. If you have no connection to Judaism, if you've never had any connection, connection to Simchas Torah or Purim or Sukkot, it's hard to have a connection to Israel because Israel is, after all, another Jewish thing. For me, one of the great, one, as worried as I am about Israel, I despair at the fact that we, the wealthiest and one of the wealthiest and largest Jewish communities in the history of the world, have also become one of the most Jewishly illiterate communities in the history of the Jewish people. And we are reaping a very bitter harvest from that. We have failed to educate our children about a tradition that has inspired the entire world. The basic literacy about our own text in our community is shocking. And, the, and, and if you have a connection to Jewish texts and tradition, and a connection to the Jewish people, you can't not have a connection to Israel, since it's the territory where so much of Jewish history took place, and it contains almost half of the Jews in the world. So I would start there. I find it amazing that a Jewish community that tells Jewish parents that the most important thing that they can do is to give their children a Jewish education, that if those Jewish parents decide that they might want to send their kids to a full-time Jewish day school, that they say, oh, by the way, you're going to have to take, a, take out a second mortgage on your home because it's so expensive, and the school has no gym, and it has no science lab. But by the way, go ahead and send your kids there. It's the most important thing you can do. Why we would ask American Jewish parents to choose between the best school they can find and a school that gives them a, their kids a commitment to Judaism is, to me, absolutely disgraceful. Um, and I think that's the beginning. Um, the kids that I find most inspiring are the kids that have a strong foundation in Jewish identity and then have been to see all of Israel. Because then you don't run away. If you're committed to the Jewish people and you know your role in Jewish history, no matter how upsetting what you may see in the West Bank is, and believe me, it's deeply upsetting, you don't run away because you know that this is your drama that you are implicated in it and you have to be part of the struggle. Thanks very much. Are we doing questions now or do we have time for? Do we still have, we have five more minutes? Can, can I just make one comment? I, I, and I, it's, it's too deep to go into it. You can think about responding if you want. But, um, you know, you're, you're, you're an excellent analyst and that's why I read you and many people read you. And, and, uh, I'll just say quickly, I, I, I hear, both in your writings, and, and, and very often tonight too, sentences that start, Israel should, Israel should do this, and Israel should do that, and I, I agree with most of what you say, I, Israel should strengthen Palestinian moderates. Yes, Israel should strengthen Pal Palestinian moderates, I, I, it's an excellent point. The issue though is not so much what Israel should do, I feel like that's a great speech to give in Israel, so Israel should do this, you, but, but the question is what should we do? We live here. We live in the United States. So there's there's a point where you you come to a block with your analysis because I, I can't I can't make them do that. I, and, and what happens then? So when Israel makes decisions that we don't agree with, so it seems to me we've got we've got two choices. I mean, we we can at that point just characterize those decisions as bad choices, wicked choices, undemocratic choices, and, and then I mean really that's not being naive. In effect, then we're, we're joining 
the worldwide anti-Zionist parade. Or we could give Israel the benefit of the doubt and say, look, we have our analysis, we, we have a sense of where Israel should go, but we don't live there. And, 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 then, and then to characterize the decisions they make, we may disagree with suddenly is the source of the problem, undemocratic, the wrong thing to do, and, and, and you can heighten your rhetoric if you want, then um, why is that useful and, and, and why would that be an obligation for us? Wouldn't, wouldn't we have at least a strong an obligation to give Israelis who live there and face the threat of security the benefit of the doubt and say, look, they're going to make decisions occasionally that we are going to agree with, but they live there and we don't. Okay, well, first of all, I think if you, take that, if, you take that, if you take that position, you need to be consistent. If you say that because you don't live in steroid, you don't have the right to criticize Israeli policy, you don't have the right to criticize Palestinians either because you also don't live in Gaza City. It seems to me you have to be consistent about the position that if you don't live in a place, you're not going to criticize the actions of its leaders. Secondly, I tend to notice in my experience that American, that rabbis are quite willing to criticize Israeli policy when it comes to the rights of non-Orthodox Jews. When it comes to the rights, when it comes to our ox being born, the rights of non-Orthodox Jews, American rabbis, in my experience, I don't know about you, are quite willing to get up on the bima and scream bloody murder because it's us who's affected. Uh, and it seems to me if you're willing to criticize Israel because what Israel does at the hotel about the right of women being able to pray, which I think is, is awful, uh, or the right, the right to non-Orthodox Jews, you should also be willing to apply that same standard when it has to do with the rights of Palestinians. <laughs> So the distinction for me is between that criticism that happens uh, from the Bima and 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 in other venues is that um, for many of us that same criticism does happen about the settlements and about the need for a two-state solution. I think my frustration with um, with your approach is that. Uh, we tend to keep that conversation internal. I don't write to my senators and I don't go and march in Washington and petition my Congress people to put pressure on Israel to make it egalitarian. I, I send money to IRAC, to the Israeli Religious Action Center. I write letters to Netanyahu. I am sure I am on like a Nixon list of his because <laughs> I've written so many I've written so many emails to him. I'm sure it just gets zoomed into the junk pile at this point. But we do <laughs> this together uh, because I do think that we advocate actually for a lot of the same things. I think my 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 challenge is uh, the nature in which we go about it because at the same time that I want to help move Israel towards being uh, a vision of an egalitarian, free Jewish democracy, um, I want to have that conversation internally because I do think that there is a real danger to giving fodder uh, to the fire of our of our enemies and. I think it's I think it's minimizing to say that the that the security concerns again it's what I said before the security concerns of Israelis living in Israel are real and it's not based on a narrative of victimhood it's based on a constant barrage of violence and threats to her existence since the day declaration was declared it is based on countless wars, it is based on intifadas, it is based on tunnels that were, as someone said before, not built so they could deliver holiday greetings. Um, so, it, you know, the threat to Israel's security, again, is real, and yes, there's this, it, it's such an entrenched, entrenched situation. Um, I also don't want to just address one thing from before, which is that I think it's, I think it's a false dichotomy. It's not, it's unfair to say that we don't in America have the same kinds of problems. Israel has a lens that is put on her that no other nation, no other sovereign nation has. Um, everything that Israel does is under such a microscope and it's an international war by proxy. Um, in America, it's not true that we don't have um, nation or people who we control who don't have the same rights. We have Native Americans who don't have um, sovereignty rights and whose land has been stripped from them and who live in deplorable conditions, totally neglected by our, by our federal government and by the cities and the states and the counties. You know, I always say when people tell me about how Israel needs to give up land, I invite them to give up their home and return it to a member of the Kumaye Nation, and then I'm happy to have the conversation. Um, and we have, we have minority communities that are not uh, dealt equally in this country. We have different sentencing in this country based on if you're uh, dealing crack cocaine or powder cocaine because you're either black or white if you're using it. We also have a huge problem of migrant laborers and undocumented immigrants 
um, who people call all kinds of names, who are not represented and who our government gives undue pressure to. And I'm, I know that that's not the topic for tonight, but I raise this to say, it's, I think it's hypocrisy to say that we're going to critique Israel for being an unjust nation and not look at the same problems at home and hold Israel to a ridiculously higher standard than every other nation on the earth which deals with these incredibly complicated human challenges. Look, let me just say a couple things in response to this. First of all, again, you can say a lot of things about me. You can't say that I ignore Americans, America's misdeeds. That's most of what I write about. Um, 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 but um, uh, even in the case of Native Americans, um, uh, about whom genocide was committed, Native Americans are citizens of this country. They're citizens of the country in which they live. They live under the same legal system, unless they choose to live under, uh, additionally, a, a Native American legal system, and they, are, they have the right to vote. That is a very fundamentally important difference. On the question of um, uh, not airing our dirty laundry for the morning, uh, and only speaking uh, critically among Jews, I would simply say that if that were the principle that was that was that was that would, that would the govern, I don't understand how anyone could have written Tanakh. I mean, is there any book which chronicles Jewish misdeeds more than the Torah and Navi and Ketuvim, the entire Hebrew Bible? It is a walking compendium of Jewish misdeeds. And, if, and yes, that has been used throughout our history against us. We read on the report that the martyrs of the Mishnaic period were called to account by the Roman emperor who said, nobody has paid for the selling of Joseph. Right? It's right about where we are in the Torah reading right now. But we have believed it was better to hold ourselves to a higher standard, even though it meant exposing our dirty laundry, than to allow ourselves to be morally corrupted. And I think in the long term, that is good for Jewish security. Bravo. Um, um, <laughs> yeah, the, uh, uh, and the, the only, one more sentence. On the question of security, I would only invite you to watch the movie The Gatekeeper to see that today, Israel's, many of the, Israel's most influential dovish voices, the people who are most alarmed about what's happening in the West Bank, are the people who used to administer the West Bank in Shin Bet, the Israel's internal security service. These are not people who live, who, who sit at coffee shops on the Upper West Side of Manhattan. <laughs> They're the people who cut their teeth trying to run the West Bank, and if you see what they have been saying in recent years about what Israel is doing, it's a lot tougher than anything I said. So here, I'll read one of the first questions. Um, Israel has um, offered, well spoken by them. Israel has offered 97% of the 22% of mandatory Palestine three times, and uh, and the Palestinians have rejected the offer. Why play into their hands over the two to three percent? Um, I think this is um, really, really important. Um, Israel has made offers. Ehud Barak in the summer of 2000 made an offer in which Israel would, would offer 91 percent of the West Bank and keep the Jordan Valley for 12, another 25 percent or so for 12 years, and there were, is, the Palestinians would get part of Jerusalem but not all the Palestinians. I can go into great detail, mind mind me detail about the, about the specifics of that. Edwin Omer offered in, in 2008 6.3 percent with a 5.7 percent land swap. The important thing is to, is to understand this: just because the Palestinians reject Israel's offer doesn't mean that they don't have an offer of their own. If I say to you, if, the, the, if I say to you, I'm willing to buy your house for, um, I'm willing to buy your house for $500,000, and you say, no, it's worth a million dollars, then you've rejected my offer. But that's not the whole story. What the, what, if you actually look at the historical record of these negotiations, what you find is that there were Palestinian offers as well. In fact, many of the Israeli chronicles and negotiators at Camp David talk about the fact that the Palestinians had an offer which was a roughly 2 or 2.5 percent land swap, in which they got control over all the Jewish neighborhoods of East Jerusalem, and which Israel had to leave the Jordan Valley within a matter of two or three or four years, and there could be an international force. This, this Palestinian position was considered untenable by Israel, just as the Israeli position was considered untenable by the Palestinians. When Edward Omer offered 6.3% with a 5.7% land swap, the Palestinians offered a 1.9% equal land swap. 
So to only tell these stories as the story of, of Palestinians rejecting Israel misses half of the story of the negotiation. The reality, if you look at the history of these negotiations, there's been a persistent gap between the Israeli positions. The Israelis always want to annex 6, 8, 10% of the West Bank. The Palestinians are never willing to allow the annexation of more than 2 or 3%. Why do the Israelis want to annex 6 to 10%? Because then you can keep 80% of the settlers in Israel. We know Ehud Barak believed that if he didn't manage to incorporate 80%, he was at risk of being assassinated, like Yahya And because if you can annex 8 or 10%, you can keep settlements like Ariel, the fourth biggest settlement which has 20,000 people. Now, why do the Palestinians reject that? Look at a map. Ariel cuts almost halfway through the West Bank. It basically cuts off the northern Palestinian cities of Kalkilia and Tokhara from the West Bank, West Bank. So the Palestinians don't want Israel to annex that much territory. Plus, they don't think that Israel can fairly compensate them for that much territory. In fact, it's amazing. If you, there are Israeli democracies who have shown that if you wanted to equally compensate Palestinians for a 6 or 8 percent land comp, uh, take settlement, uh, uh, if Israel wants to keep 6 or 8 percent of the West Bank and wants to compensate the Palestinians for land inside Israel, it would actually have to move Israelis off of their kibbutzes and moshavs inside the Green Line in order to have enough high quality land to trade. So this is, now there's also a difference on the Jordan Valley. Israel wants to keep under Netanyahu, indefinite control. Barack wanted 12 years. The Palestinians want Israel to leave the Jordan Valley consistently within about three years, and they'll accept an international force. There's a divide about how much of East Jerusalem the Palestinians should be able to control. There's a divide about refugees. The Israelis have been willing to offer about, the highest offers have been about 20,000 refugees. We know that Ehud Omer, from the, we know from the reporting that Mahmoud Abbas said that asked Israel to accept 150,000 refugees. Um, my point is not to say who's right in these debates. It's simply to say that this is a story of negotiations in which the two sides have a difference of opinion, not in which one side has offered everything and the other side has been rejections. The, the, um, and I think the reason that I, find that, I, that I worry so much about settlement growth is precisely because it widens and exacerbates this very divide, which is hard enough to bridge as it is. Another question um, from the audience. I joined J Street recently and, and, and am a supporter of the two-state solution and a stronger opponent of the settlements. But I also worry that a future Palestinian state may eventually be ruled by the likes of Hamas and ISIS. What would you say to many others like me who have similar concerns? Um, the first thing I would say is that you're right to be concerned. Look, nobody who, who supports a two-state solution should claim that there are no risks with a Palestinian state. Of course there are risks. You'd be a fool to say there are no risks. But I think what's important to recognize is that there, there, is, there is no path that does not involve risk for Israel. Either path involves a risk. Permanent control over millions of people who lack basic rights is a recipe for permanent war and a recipe for Israel becoming more and more of a pariah in the world. So that is a very, very risky path too. Imagine what Israel would do if millions of Palestinians marched peacefully and said, we love you, we want to be citizens of the state of Israel. Just make us citizens. How would Israel deal with that? That would be a very grave threat. So you have to balance the potential threats. I would say this about, about what, what might happen in the peace agreement. Israel's experience with unilateral withdrawals, whether from Gaza or southern Lebanon, has been very bad. That's why I do not advocate a unilateral Israeli withdrawal from the West Bank. I would like Israel to stop subsidizing settlement growth and maybe even pay people to go back inside the Green Line, but I don't advocate Israel unilaterally pulling the IDF out of the West Bank. But Israel's experience with peace agreements has been very good. Israel signed two with Jordan and Egypt. There are a lot of people in Jordan and Egypt who really, really don't like Israel. Um, and yet those peace agreements have held for decades. Look what happened in Egypt. Egypt had a revolution that brought in the Muslim Brotherhood, which is, after all, the parent body of Hamas, essentially, and then a counter-revolution that brought in this brutal, more secular decade. During two Gaza wars, they didn't cut ties with Israel. Uh, uh, and, and, and the reason is because these Egyptian political leadership have recognized that this peace agreement is ultimately in their interest. 
They made that decision when they signed it, and they've been obligated and held to it because of it. And that, it seems to me, we don't know what would happen in a Palestinian state, but I think it's important to recognize that Israel's experience with peace agreements has actually been very good. This is another question from the audience. Do you support an accommodation with Hamas? Sorry? Do you support an accommodation with Hamas? I guess it, uh, here's, what I, here's what I support. I believe that if Hamas or any other Palestinian organization uh, takes violent actions against Israel, Israel has not only the right, but the obligation to defend its citizens. I was in Israel during the first week of the war. I was glad that Israel was defending its citizens. I happened to be one of the people who was defending at that point. But I, I also believe that Palestinian political parties that don't accept the two-state solution, like Hamas, should be allowed to run in Palestinian elections. If they act violently, they should be retaliated against. But the fact that they don't accept Israel's right to exist, the fact that they don't support the two-state solution, should not be a bar for them running in elections. Since, after all, Israel allows political parties that don't accept the two-state solution to run in its elections. Um, the important thing to ask of Hamas is not that Hamas, it, it, the, the really important question is not whether Hamas as a political organization, as an organization accepts Israel's right to exist. The important thing is to demand that Hamas accept the will of the Palestinian people as expressed in a referendum. If there is a peace agreement, there will be a referendum amongst Israelis and amongst Palestinians. The important thing is that Hamas, regardless of the view as a party, accept the will of the Palestinian people as reflected in a referendum. And it's interesting. You know which other political party has the view that they as a party do not accept the two-state solution, but they would abide by the will of their people as expressed in a referendum? Likud. The Likud, the last time Likud had a political platform, which was in 2006, it was explicitly opposed to a Palestinian state and explicitly in support of permanent Israeli control over all the land. So how does Netanyahu get around the fact that his party is against the two-state solution? He says that his party will accept the will of the Israeli people as expressed in a referendum. I think that is the principle that we should also apply to Hamas. I would also say parenthetically, if you want to defeat Hamas in an election, which I dearly, dearly hope the Palestinians will do, there are a couple of things you can do. First of all, you can show that Mahmoud Abbas's way, which is security, cooperation, and acceptance of Israel's right to exist, you can show that it works. And beyond that, the political choice among Palestinians is not just between Mahmoud Abbas and Hamas. The most popular Palestinian leader today is Marwan Barghouti, who is sitting in jail. Marwan Barghouti, who was involved in the Second Intifada, terrorist acts, no question about it, but has been a very vocal proponent of the two-state solution, would wipe the floor with Hamas in an election. It's not even close if you look at Palestinian polling. If Israel really wants a strong Palestinian leadership that will defeat Hamas and support the two-state solution, its most powerful ally is sitting in an Israeli jail. So I have another, I have another one here, and uh, just uh, um, in, in the New York Times op-ed, kind of famous about three, four years ago, you supported a, a boycott of products that were manufactured in the West Bank. Do you still support that? And maybe as long as I'll, I'll just add this up with a question. So what I would add is maybe you can talk a little bit about your relationship with boycotts in general and BDS. Um, yeah, I, um, I, 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 I oppose, um, as does J Street, uh, the BDS movement against Israel. And in fact, um, uh, Israel opposes any boycotts of any part of Israel. Um, uh, I am a little bit more, I guess you could say, radical than that. My view is this. My view is, I want the money that I spend in Israel to be spent in the part of Israel that's democratic, not the part of Israel that's not democratic. So I support not buying products made in the settlements if I spend that money on products bought inside democratic Israel. So I support not buying settlement products if it's twinned with an affirmation of Israel's right to exist within the 1967 war. I took that position in significant measure because I was inspired by some of the Israelis who I admire the most. The novelists David Grossman, Amos Oz, and Aleph Bet Yehushua, all who have said publicly that they will not perform in the settlement of Ariel because they believe it represents a violation of Israel's core principles and a threat to its future. Interestingly, another figure who's come out recently and boycotted the University of Ariel is the head of the Weizmann Institute of Science, Israel's most prominent scientific institution. Um, so um, I, that, that is my personal view. I happen to believe 
um, that it is actually um, a very effective way of opposing the larger BDS movement. Because you have to understand, the BDS movement makes no distinction between the West Bank and Israel proper. For them, for most of their leaders, all of it is apartheid. All of it is, is illegitimate. And I believe that the BDS movement's great ally is this Israeli government. Why? Because this Israeli government is erasing the line. It is destroying the, the boundary between Israel and the West Bank, and therefore creating the one-state reality that the BDS movement feeds off of. Since it is core to the BDS movement that there is no moral distinction between the part of Israel where Palestinians have the right to vote and the part of Israel that don't. And it's actually interesting. It was a very, uh, Omar Barghouti, who's probably the, maybe the most important leader of the BDS movement around the world, came to speak at Columbia last week. And I want to quote what he said to you. He said, we've got to give credit to Netanyahu. Without him, we could not have reached this far at this time. It could have taken much, much, much longer. But with the help of the Israeli government, our biggest closet supporters in the world were going much faster. The thing which has strengthened the BDS movement more than anything else is the death of the two-state solution and the erasing of the boundary between democratic and non-democratic Israel. For me, making that distinction, saying I want to spend my money here and not that, I think of it as like Havdalah. It's like separation. It's a moral separation between the part of Israel that I consider to be based on democratic principles and the part that isn't. So I have, uh, I think, what's going to be the last question. Uh, Peter, in your talk, you said that you believe Israel should not be a secular state. Can you elaborate why you believe that? Sure. Um, what I mean is, that um, I believe that is, it is legitimate, and this is a point which divides me from many people on the left and from all of my Palestinian friends. Um, I believe that it is legitimate for Israel to have a special obligation to the Jewish people. We do not have that in the United States. There is no preferential immigration policy for a particular ethnic group because, and we do not have religious symbols on our flag and in our national anthem. But many, many European countries do. Many, many European countries have crosses on their flags and have preferential immigration policies for members of a certain ethnic group. Germany does, Poland does. Uh, I believe if, we have a, if there's a Palestinian state, it will, have, it will have Palestinian symbols and probably Islamic symbols in its national anthem and in its flag, and it will have a preferential immigration policy for Palestinians. I therefore believe it is legitimate for Israel to have that same view, the same position, given, the his, given how much of a price Jews have paid for not having a state that has a particular special obligation to Jewish welfare. Um, uh, and um, uh, as long as Israel at least gives those non-Jews who live under its domain the right to vote and the right to citizenship. Um, uh, for me, Israel is not only uh, um, uh, a place that I want to live out ethical dreams, that I want to be a light unto the nations, that I want to live up to its own majestic founding principles. It's also because I want there to be one country in the world that has as its mission statement the protection of Jewish life. So that if, God forbid, there were another group of Jews around the world who were in, were in peril, there would be one state around the world that had as its primary mission the saving of their lives. Maybe that's because my own family story is not a story of having been in the United States happily for 100 years. My grandmother, my grandmother's family came from Turkey in the Isle of Rhodes, my grandmother, where there are no more Jews. My grandmother was born in Alexandria, Egypt, where there are no more Jews. She grew up in her teenage years in the Belgian Congo, where there are no more Jews. And now she lived, in, and until her death this summer, she lived in Cape Town, South Africa, in a place where Jews are more in peril, significantly more in peril, and Jewish life is more fragile than it is in the United States. That is a big part of what made me a Zionist. I want Israel to remain that place, but I don't believe that Israel will be able to in the long run if it doesn't try to maintain its democratic character. Thanks. Good evening, I'm Janice Steinberg. I'm a founding member of J Street San Diego and a member of a temple, Temple Emmanuel. Someone congratulated me on my courage in being the closing speaker tonight. <laughs> I would like to congratulate all of us on our courage in being here to grapple with really complicated issues. Issues that bring up intense emotions. 
Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Peter Beinart, for coming here and giving an important, thought-provoking talk. Thank you to Congregation Beth Israel for providing a venue for tonight's program. I want to thank Rabbi Burke, Rabbi Gerson, Rabbi Grabart, and Rabbi Marcus for participating. We applaud your leadership in setting an example of the civil, respectful dialogue that all of us have to have about the future of Israel. I want to thank Hannah Cohen and Eric Winston of J Street for organizing the event taking the lead on the event. I really appreciate what Rabbi Burke said. Essentially, no one has cornered the market on being a Zionist, loving Israel. I believe that many of us share the dream of Israel as a democracy and the homeland of the Jewish people. A secure Israel in which Jews study ancient texts and are at the forefront of technological and artistic innovation. A haven where Jews from around the world will always find an open door. Where we may differ, and we may differ passionately, is in how we feel that we as American Jews can best support Israel. For me, and for 180,000 Americans, J Street has given us a way to stand with Israel by advocating with our representatives in Washington so that America, Israel's strongest ally in the international community, will do everything it can to bring about a two-state solution. If that speaks to you as well, um, I hope you will consider joining me in J Street San Diego and at the J Street National Conference in Washington in March. I attended the first national gathering last year, my first national gathering. It was inspiring to hear from US and Israeli officials how grateful they are that J Street has expanded the conversation. You can learn more about the conference and about our work here in San Diego at the registration table. And I have to tell you to make sure to get your parking validated. <laughs> On a deeply serious note, please continue this vital conversation about the future of Israel. Talk to your friends and family. Talk to people with whom you passionately disagree, who may of course be your friends and family. <laughs> Do it with respect. Let's make our San Diego Jewish community a model of civil dialogue about Israel. I want to wish everyone a happy Hanukkah. May this time of kindling the Hanukkah lights bring more light to Israel and to the world. Thank you. <laughs>